This is CBS Eye on the World. I'm John Batchelor. It is 1770. We're with Captain Cook off the coast of what will become Australia. The captain records in his log, he sees a smoking cape. This moment in history is a way of talking about a phenomenon that is worldwide and that challenges civilization in the Northern Hemisphere, Greece, Spain, Italy, in the Southern Hemisphere, especially Australia, but Argentina and Chile, wildfires, they're called in California, bushfires, they're called in Australia. A new book that is an old book, a book that is necessary now and was necessary when it was written a dozen years ago, A Future in Flames. Daniel Claude is the author. Daniel is very generous to come back after I interviewed her about her wonderful new book, Koalas. And in the course of that conversation, we talked about the horror of a wildfire to a koala because koalas cling to their source of energy, which is a eucalyptus tree. And eucalyptus in a fire are very dangerous. Danielle, I congratulate you for having anticipated the fate of the planet a dozen years ago, because we're now in a a situation where wildfires, we're told, are going to become routine, not rare. And perhaps every year there'll be damage to the environment, to the economy, and of course to people and wildlife. I begin with the Captain Cook reference because we need to understand that wildfires are not, or bushfires, are not a product of civilization. They were always there. What did Captain Cook see? What what was the cape he was watching? Good evening to you. Uh, good evening. Lovely to be here. Thanks for having me back. Um, yeah, the, the early uh, European explorers uh, traveling around the coast of Australia frequently reported seeing fires. It, it was an important thing they were looking for because it indicated whether there were people um, ashore. They, they thought that that was a good indicator of campfires and those sorts of things. But but there were a lot of fires observed along the coast. So this this was a very frequent uh, occurrence, and, and some of them were clearly a, a bit bigger than a campfire. And Captain Cook saw a, a bushfire, is that what he's recording? And, no, and it would have been vast for him to see it at sea, I believe. Uh, James Banks saw Tasman of Tasmania saw in 1802. He also saw fire. And when they mm-hmm. reported this back to Europe, did Europe make sense of it? Did it have any experience at the time of of the fires at the scale we're talking about? No, I don't. I don't think. I don't think they really interpreted that that way. Uh, in my reading of the exploration journals from a wide range of explorers, they they tend to be just looking at whether this indicates. Whether they look like they're fires out of control or whether they look like they're um, deliberately lit, so they're really interested in whether there are people there. So, so they tend to report campfire, report everything as a as a possible campfire. But there are certainly, once they went ashore, quite a few of them observed really intense fires that clearly were out of control. So ones that had, you know, burned all the vegetation, um, not not just little domestic fires. But I think that's a really important thing to consider in, in when we think about fires is the different ways they occurred naturally and also the different ways people have used them through our, our very long history. We have, humans have a very long history of using fire uh, so, you know, it goes right back into our prehistory. So we, we have a long history of using fire and we use it in lots of different ways. We go to the first fleet. This is the arrival of Europeans in Australia to begin the colony, the Botany Bay colony, and then to expand into the arable land. They start, as I understand, in the southeast of the country, which is now called New South Wales. The early settlers, the early farmers, they used fire, but at the same time, they watched how the indigenous people, the Aborigines, used fire. Well, it was—it's a tool. How did the? How, how was that tool used first by the Aborigines and then by the colonists? Yeah, so I think that's something we often underestimate in Australia, and this is probably common elsewhere. We we underestimate how much we have learned from indigenous people, although we don't always apply those lessons well, um, and. It's pretty clear that Indigenous people used fire in a diversity of ways prior to, well, for, throughout their long history. Um, 
to they they use it for hunting. They use it to you know get get game to come out of the of the thick forests. They use it to clear passage for for movement. They they use it for signalling and for messaging neighbouring communities. And of course, they use it for for defence and for warfare. And they use it for um, for campfires of course as well and I think that this issue of using it to manage the land is a really important one that we're only just coming back to terms with understanding how they used it to stimulate new growth so they use it selectively in some areas and not in others so that the next year when they come back they've got a whole heap of new shoots and edible components um, and also to promote grass for grazing animals so that they've got better prey so we call this fire stick farming um, as, a, as a recognition of that land that land management system that has been perfected over m- more than 60,000 years in Australia and it's really integral to the Australian ecology um, and when Europeans arrived they had no idea about any of this all they saw was that you could use fire to clear land and they did so pretty un- indiscriminately um, to clear clear the forests. Yeah, before we go to the pyromaniac settlers, I believe is one <laughs> term. Before we go to that, did the indigenous people, the Aborigines, did they use fire to clear a highway, travel between places? It depends really on the area that um, people live in. We have to remember Australia is a very big continent and has very diverse um, range of different ecologies so some areas are grassland some areas are dense forest it seems that they probably did use fire in some of the dense forests on the south to in Tasmania and in Victoria to help clear access not just for themselves but also for um, grazing animals and things so they they that that also they benefit from this as well so it's not so much a highway but but certainly to to clear the undergrowth um, and, and to stop it, it stops it from getting so thick. So early explorers often describe these forests as being park-like. You know, Dumont Duville described the forest as being as beautiful as a park in Paris. Um, and after Europeans had been here for a while, those those parklands weren't there anymore. So they, they were clearly uh, um, part of, uh, you know, a, a process of land management that we, we we're only just beginning to recognise and, and appreciate. Yes, it turns out, we're grass eaters, just like the sheep. And grass is something that burns in Australia and it regenerates very quickly. And that, so the economy prospers on the basis of being able to clear land and regenerate it for your sheep herd. Of course, the fires get out of control. Is there a sense from the literature in the 19th century, this is the 1850s and afterwards, that they feared fire, they feared the fires that we have today, or, or were they relaxed about it because there were, there were, there were so few of them? How, what was the attitude? Yeah, I think in the early days, you know, when there was relatively few, you know, population was low, um, and European population was pretty scattered. Um, a lot of the people who were using fire were out in the rural areas and very isolated areas, and. It was, it, but it was certainly a threat. Um, you know, uncontrolled fires are a threat, but on, at the same time, burning through a big patch of bush where they didn't think anybody lived, even though that is where Indigenous people lived, um, they didn't see that as being a problem. So, so I guess they were a little bit more lackadaisical about the use of fire. Um, and that became an increasing problem as the numbers of people in those high fire prone areas increased. Uh, and certainly pretty early on, by about 1851, they started to realise they had a real problem on their hands. Yes, I learned that every day of the week has been named black at some point. There's black, <laughs> Tuesday, black, black Monday. Yep, yeah. all red. Black, <laughs> yeah, black, black Thursday, 1851. Uh, 5 February 1851, and it's important now to remember, upside down world, January Mm. and February are summertime. Right now it's springtime in Australia. January 51, 5 February 1851, a hot northerly blows in, 47 degrees centigrade. My goodness. I I think that's like 120 or more uh, Fahrenheit, and it drives... It drives through and blows right through. So we need now to turn about what to turn to what burns the science of wildfires or bushfires, as they're called in Australia. The book is A Future in Flames, highly recommended, especially to California and the West of the United States to understand 
This is a global phenomenon that is going to get routine over these next decades. We come now to the question of what burns. In, in my conversation with you about the koala, I learned that eucalyptus is a torch when it's hit by fire because of the eucalyptus oil and burns very quickly and then blows through. There's another tree that also you write about, the mountain ash. And that tree, the ash forest of Australia, both the eucalyptus and the mountain ash regenerate very quickly. Is that correct, Danielle? Yeah, so so mountain ash is a eucalypt as well. It's it's actually the largest of all the eucalypts and the largest hardwood in the in the in the world. It's as tall, if if not possibly taller, in the past than the the redwoods, California. Um, and the the eucalypts are, are what we call a fire adapted um, group of plants. So they're drought adapted, and those drought adaptations have happen to have made them um, resilient in the, generally in the face of fire. So they they regenerate after fire. They they most of you know there's a lot of deaths, but there's also majority usually survive fires. Mountain ash has an interesting history because it actually does die after fire, but it releases a huge load of seed into the forest and it needs a lot of sun to regenerate. So in the aftermath of a of a fierce fire a very very fierce fire and mountain ash fires are notoriously fierce they only happen every two or three hundred years naturally um and the forests burn really fiercely and then the cleared areas are just repop you know re-seeded with all these mountain ash so mountain ash all grow at the same rate and all together so there's the same stand forests which makes them really spectacular but also extremely terrifying when they actually burn because it's incredibly fierce the start of fires. There's lightning, which is an explanation for the early tens of thousands of years of Australia. There are power lines and there's arson. I was shocked to learn in your reporting that 50% of your fires are arson. Purposeful arson, meaning to kill people, arson? No, look, arson's a really complicated issue. Um I'm not sure of the exact figures at the moment about how frequent, but they are frequently lit, but they're very often less dangerous than some of the other fires, lightning fires and electric faults and those sorts of things, mostly because they're, they're sometimes sometimes they're lit for attention. You know, people, people want to see the fire trucks come out, so they light them somewhere where they're going to be seen, not the, where the fires are going to be seen easily. So, so they're not... I, I don't know how often they would be lit to harm people. I think it's more people who have a psychological issue with fire and fire trucks and things like that. Uh, I also need to attend to the fuel. We've mentioned the eucalyptus, but it's the undergrowth. That's the story in the West of the United States. And your undergrowth has a mixed record. You talk about weeds, but it's particular kinds of weeds. There's one weed. I have it in my notes. It doesn't come to me at hand that it's supposed to be fireproof, but you find that it burns very quickly. <laughs> well, this is one of the interesting things about preparing for fires is is everything burns ultimately. You know, it just has to have the right conditions to burn, even, even you know, steel and things like that will combust at some point. Um but it has to be, you know, that that's it's it's what burns easily or not. So under some conditions, some bushes, if they've got lots of water, if they've been, if they've, you know, their leaves are nice and succulent, then they they are harder to burn. Um, but ultimately, they will. You can make most things burn if you try hard enough. So I think that's the issue we need to look at. We need to look at the particular conditions the species are under and whether they burn and. Things that grow on one side of the country might not burn very well, but things that grow here do burn more because it's it's drier or the conditions are drier. So so it's it's really a a very personal um, voyage to work out what is what makes your property safer. Yes, yeah, so I have the, I found the list here. You have blackberries, Spanish heath, wattles, and the burning weed that's not supposed to burn is pitosporums. I... Yes, yes, pitosporum. Yes, that's that's a that's a and but again, it's a complicated thing because if you have a pitosporum hedge, 
that's well watered, uh, it will actually protect your home from ember attack. So, you know, the, the embers might drop into the, but if, it, if it's nice and damp, then it works like a sponge. But if your petostrums get hot enough, then potentially they can go up quite fast. And also there's lots of different species, so it probably differs by species as well. H.C. Wells has a quote in Daniel's book that I enjoyed a great deal. The, the heart of it is fire is not an invader. It's a gorilla. And it, it's very opportunistic with those sparks flying. And the response in Australia eventually was the very famous fire brigades. And we have a moment here to praise them. Uh, fire brigades started with insurance companies. I'm following Daniel's reporting in the late 19th century. But it was a 1939 big fire that got everybody launched. And Danielle, I'm impressed how much of the fire brigades are volunteers, not paid people at mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so insurance companies were the ones who started the township brigades. Um, so, that, so they're particularly interested in protecting buildings. But that kind of left the country areas unprotected, um, the, you know, the, the farmers and the people who lived in the bush. So rural communities established their own parallel brigades. So we have, now we have town metropolitan fire brigades and we have bush fire brigades. So the bush fire brigades were started by volunteers themselves and they started in, the first one was 1901, um, a small town called Berrigan in the, on the, in the Riverland near the River Murray after some major fires and, and also the Federation drought, which in Australia was a really, really terrible drought. So people were very worried about fires so so they banded together and organized themselves and that was a model that rolled out across many rural communities but after the 1939 fires in victoria which were enormous um government stepped in and started funding those brigades and organizing a, a state body that could manage them and oversee them and support them and, that, and that's continued ever since all right let's talk about what you can do for yourself because australia is pragmatic and inventive Daniel Claude, the book is A Future in Flames. I'm John Batchelor. A Future in Flames is about wildfires in the U.S., bushfires in Australia. Same thing. It's a phenomenon, although there are different vegetation, different hemispheres, different wind conditions. And yet, what do you do if you live in a fire zone, which apparently, as far as I can tell, all of Australia is eventually in a fire zone. There's a difference between fire risk parts of Australia and fire likely parts of Australia, vast parts of the center of the country. I've never been there, Danielle, so help me if I get this wrong. The West and the North, uh, Northern Territory and the center are without many people and without many settlements. The settlements are along the coast, South Coast and the Southeast Coast and the East Coast. And those areas are fire risk. So we come to what kind of fires? Daniel has a whole section devoted to the big ones. They're not every year. We've mentioned 1939, but they come often enough so that you must think about them when, whenever you change your address. Danielle, you started early in life before the babies. You lived in urban settings. I'm going to guess Adelaide. Maybe you lived in Sydney, but you moved to this uh, Victoria, the southern part of the continent, and you moved into the outskirts of a city where one of the first people who called upon you most kindly was the captain of the fire brigade. You were early in your marriage. Were you ready for that, that he was going to recruit you and your husband to be part of a fire brigade? Did you know that was coming? Yeah, I think I think actually it was something that we did know about before we moved into the area. We were aware of the fire risks and we we did select the property on the basis of, of its ability to be safe from fires. So so yeah, I think I'd always grown up with a fire risk. I I lived in rural areas when I was a child and I remember sitting watching a fire approaching um, we lived in a caravan in the bush, which is possibly the worst thing you can do in terms of fire risk. Um so, and I remember living in S Sydney for a little while, and fires burning right into the into the national parks. Um, so you know, smoke coming over. So fire is very much uh, apparent. Although you re you're relatively safe in a city, uh, cities are not not particularly in the middle. The edges are prone to bushfires, but not the in middle bit. Um, but yeah, everywhere in Australia is really a fire risk area. 
Um, you can have fires pretty anywhere where there's native vegetation. There's a there's a risk of fires. So so yeah, it is something we were prepared for. But um, I guess we like most people, we kind of underestimated the amount of effort you have to go to to keep yourself safe. It does take constant constant effort and constant planning. And, and planning, and you, you have uh, Daniel has a very attractive blog that she keeps up to date about the koala now there's a that's a wonderful koala does that koala in your blog have a name uh, no they just move through so we we have we have um, numerous koala visitors from time I, to time it was it was it was a scene stealer when i saw him in any event you also when you moved into adelaide hills which is south australia this is victoria if i get yeah. your geography wrong uh, forgive me i'm learning <laughs> that's fine you're doing really well <laughs> The part that I that I hadn't occurred to me is that you had to protect your underfloor spaces. What does that mean? What were you thinking? Uh, yeah, so so houses that are built on 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 stumps and have a wooden floor are very vulnerable to fire because you know they often have stuff under. If you store stuff underneath them, the the embers can get under the house and set fire to the house. So it, it just it's you know when you make a when you're making a campfire, you sit your sticks up against each other, so there's a little bit of airflow through underneath, and that helps you get the fire going. If you put your your wood right on the ground, it's going to be really hard to light. So the same thing applies to houses, except in reverse. You don't want them to to light. So houses on concrete slabs with or with sealed off understory um, is a, it underfloor space is a much safer design for bushfires. So so yeah, we moved from Victoria. Um, after the major fire, um, the, the Black Saturday fires, um, to South Australia. Um, but South Australia is also vulnerable to fires, so um, we had to take that into account. But we built our house here, so this house that we live in now is built for bushfires. Yes, uh, I have to picture what happens. It's not the fire coming up to the edge of your property and leaping under your roof, which is what happens in California, if I understand I've never been in a bush, a wildfire in California. I've only watched video. You have embers blowing ahead of the fire. So that's what Wells, I think that's what Wells meant about gorilla. Even though mm. you can't, the fire's not right outside your window. Your house is vulnerable to those embers and a black smoke. Is that what happens? It blinds you? Yeah, look, these things are universal. So this will be the same in California as it is in Australia. You can have... Um, you have ground fires, so the fire naturally burns along the ground, and but in an intense fire, it will spread up into the. If it's hot enough, it will spread up into the trees, and then you get a canopy fire. Canopy fires are harder to sustain, but uh, they still need the heat from the ground. So that's why under, managing your undergrowth is really important to to try and stop it getting up into the trees. Once it's up in the trees, and you start to get that really extreme fire weather, then sure you can get you can get flames traveling quite a long distance in high winds, um, which fires create themselves, so they generate their own weather. Um, so those those are all the sort of horrific disaster scenarios. But the big risk to houses is mostly ember attack. Um, the, gra the ground fires are dangerous if you have a lot of bush close to your house, which is why we recommend having a cleared area around your house. And the further, the better. You know, in Australia, in rural areas, 100 metres is a is the management zone for fire around your house, for ground fire. Once it's further away than that, you it's embers that you need to watch out for. But and embers come down like red rain in a in a serious fire. But they, you know, if you think about if you flick a match, a lit match into onto dry grass uh, or, or you know anywhere it's not necessarily going to catch most times it'll go out and that's the same with embers most of them go out but you've got to be ready to get the little ones out um that do catch so it, it's not like a being firebombed or something it, it, although it depends on the circumstances it's 2009 you're at home with your daughters and your dog your husband mike is at the fire brigade and you're getting reports all the time. The phone's ringing back and forth. Where's the fire? When are we leaving? Uh, uh, this is the wonderful part. Everybody's drinking water. Her, your youngest daughter is filling up everything in the house with water. The only one who drinks is the dog. Who, who It upsets his stomach. So it's a wonderful scene. But I want to say this day, everybody survived. Mike is fine. You don't know for a few hours. However, this is the part where you have 
much attention to stay or go, stay or go. Mm -hmm. They're fire ban days. There are not many of them. What'd you say, 10 a year in the part of Australia you live in? So yes, those, yes. those are the days you can leave even before you see a fire. Is that correct? You, mm -hmm. you just say it because the weather conditions. What are the weather conditions you would watch for on a fire ban day? Yeah, so fire ban days are when um, fires are not permitted to be lit at all anywhere. So that that's what a fire ban day means. So we, we now have different ratings. So we also have warning day. You know, mo we have more and more fire ban days. It, it's in, you know, it's becoming like the whole of summer is a total fire ban day. So and and beyond. So it's no longer just ten. It's a lot more than that now. Um, and on those days, on those high risk days, whatever they are, you need to decide whether you're going to stay in your home and and um, or whether you leave early. And the, and the the policy is you should leave on every high fire risk day. And certainly, I did that when my children were small. Um, but as they got older, I decided that I would stay and defend. Now that's that's a big decision. You you should only do that if you're really well prepared. Um, but these decisions sometimes we don't have a choice. Sometimes we might get caught out by a fire that starts really close to our home, and it might be too late to leave. And leaving late is a very dangerous strategy. Um, you, you know, you really want to have a backup plan in case you get stuck um, so at home. You need to have a safe place to shelter. In a worst case scenario, it's not not something you you want hope happens, but it, it may happen. So, um, yeah, it, it's very much something you have to think through, something you have to talk to your household about. You may need to make sure everybody knows what your plan is, that everybody's on board with it, and that everybody's prepared for the different eventualities that might happen. The wind is a major factor, and I tried to get an understanding of what you're watching for. At one point, you live in a gully, and the wind goes right over the top of the gully, endangering your neighbor's house, but not yours. But mm. Does the wind come before the fire? If the fire is approaching, does the wind pick up and blow your way? Does it? It depends. Yeah, it, it depends on the on the weather. So um, you can have you know the winds of the day. So hot. We often get hot northerlies in Australia that blow off the desert. They're quite dangerous because they're hot and dry. Um, so any windy day is a danger if you've got fires um, r running. So. So wind is a big factor. We all know that if you know you're trying to get your fire going, you blow on it to get it going. So oxygen plus fuel plus lack of water is the triangle for for, for bad fire conditions, and that, and they, they're the days we've got to worry. But once a fire gets going, it actually starts a cycle that generates wind. Um, so so it can actually cause the wind to get worse. Um, than what it was before and and the other problem are wind changes so what happens is we get a get a fire that starts and it follows the wind and so you can imagine a long thin line of fire just moving in one direction gradually getting a bit wider but it leaves a long trail of burning behind it now if the wind changes you've then suddenly got that long line becomes a fire front that moves forward and then you've got a huge fire that runs. So fire, wind changes are a big risk in fires. All right, the wind has changed. It's time to go. Can't defend the house. You get in the car and you start driving with conditions that can collapse, visibility co conditions. The highway, you're going through the fire or the fire suddenly approaches you. And Danielle, the scariest moment in her book is if you're caught in your car in a fire. The first thing you do is you turn the air conditioner off, you close all the windows as tight as possible. You you leave your engine running, your headlights on, I'm following Danielle's reporting. And here comes the scary part, a woolen blanket. You need to duck down with a woolen blanket below the glass. Why, Daniel? What does a woolen blanket mean? Yeah, so basically, the, the this is a hot, really, I, I stress, this is not an a, a advice of what you should plan to do. That's, that's, it's a terrible thing to leave, to leave late and have to escape in your car. That you, Jeff, that's the worst thing. You don't want to do that. You want to have left early. But in the circumstances where you are caught in your car, um, it's always a good idea to travel with a woolen blanket in your car and water. So that's just standard summertime thing that you have in your car. Woolen blankets don't don't catch fire um, rather than polyester, but they're basically a thermal shield. So the main thing is radiant heat that kills people in fires. It's not 
usually the flames themselves um, if they can obviously that will kill you but radiant heat is the big killer so you've got to try and put a barrier between yourself and and the heat source so you know if you're in front of the fire and a, a campfire or something and it gets a bit hot and you put put a, a blanket in front of you it'll shield you from the heat that's what you're doing in the car so um, the important thing with cars is to stay in a cleared area. Modern cars actually ha perform reasonably well, you know, in fires. You don't want them catching fire. Cars do burn. But um, if, you, if you park somewhere where there's not much fuel, that's the safest place to be. So look for a cleared area, a close mode, oval, something as far away from vegetation as you can. Um, or, you know, but staying in the car, the car does offer some protection from heat. It's not a perfect solution, but probably one of the worst things people do is can get out of the car and run, and you can't, out, you can't really outrun a fire, and the radiant heat is very dangerous. And drinking water to reduce your dehydration. So that's why you have water in the car, not to wet the blanket, but to drink for yourself. Uh, yeah, so I think... Yeah, and just, I mean, you, you might, you know, if there's little fires, you know, once the fire front's passed and you get out of the car, there's still going to be little fires around, so you want a bit of water to try and put the fires out as well. So water is always a good thing to have around fires. Wetting the blanket is a bit, bit fraught because sometimes that can turn to steam, which is not a great thing. So um, yeah, I'm not sure what the advice is on that, but, you know, it's not an ideal situation to be in. These are these are last resort things. But I do put a woolen blanket in my car and a, a big tub of water every summer. So just in case you get caught somewhere. Uh, the book is A Future in Flames. Daniel Claude is the author. When we come back, the future. Daniel, we come to El Nino. It's upon you. Your metropolitan, your metropolitan weather bureau waited a long time to declare it, but it has now declared. What that means is hot and dry. And I've been following your weather throughout Australia. You've had a lot of heat and a lot of dry air early. Does this look to be a dangerous fire season or just ordinary? Look, uh, fire season. I, I regard all fire seasons as dangerous. <laughs> you never know when when one's going to hit. The the we had a fire two years ago that burnt through our neighbourhood and burnt um, right along the edge of my properties. Um, and that was not a bad season, and it was not a high risk day. Um, unfortunately, that was an arsonist who did a very good job of setting fire to the park below my house. Uh, so these things can happen at any time under the strangest conditions. However, you know, the dry conditions um, and the, the hot summers um, combined with a high fuel load from previous wet years does make for dangerous conditions in many areas. And we know that with climate change, the incidence and frequency and severity of fires is increasing rapidly. So we are now seeing far more fires than we have in the past. Uh, and, and that just increases everybody's risk. So, so yes, we, we are looking at a, a scenario of increased fire risk um, for, for across most of the country. And the fires, the question here in, the, in California, for example, in a couple of fires that have been very, very damaging, a lot of loss of life. And the question in Hawaii recently with the Maui fire is, uh, do you build too close to the fire fuel? In other words, is is the civilization's need to spread out? Is that part of the problem? And is there a debate about allowing people to to live in high damage uh, in high risk areas? Yeah, well, I mean that's a difficult question, isn't it? I mean, I, I love living in bushland areas. I love the native vegetation, and so I do. I do want to live in a country area, but it does come with risks. Um, those risks are, are rare. They're even even with the increased fire risk, it's still a rare event. Um, so I think we just need to learn how to live safely if we're going to live in those areas. And the real risk comes from not so much from rural communities that have lived with these risks for a long time. Um, it's often more of a problem in urban interface areas. So people moving into the foothills, you know, bushy areas surrounding cities on the outskirts of cities. So we have high population, low preparedness for fires, low experience of fires, Often people who don't live in the area, they work in town, but live, you know, they live in the area, but they work in the city. Um, so those things all increase the risk. And, and so we really need to look at ways of helping people prepare better. I, I think it's just a matter of recognising that 
you live in a fire zone and you have to be prepared. Not all fires are the same. I'm learning. You can have, I think recently the reporting was that you had 40 fires going in New South Wales, but they weren't, um, I don't know what the word is. They weren't likely to be damaging severe. Yeah. Damage. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's all but, a matter of degree, but you, you have, it's a judgment call. Is that how it works? Yeah, look, there's fires burning across Australia pretty much all the time. So, you know, in the in the north and the west, we have fires burning all the time. Um, a fire, Australia is a very fire-prone country. We just get upset about it when it happens close to people um, and where people live. Um, and also in forests, it depends. If it's, a, if it's a big park, Australia tends to let those fires just take their course rather than in America where they had a policy of, you know, complete fire suppression which long-term actually increases your risk because it makes makes the fires worse when they do get out of control. We also have a policy of um, pre preventative burning. So we actually burn a lot of our forests intentionally as a preparation, so to reduce the fuel load. Um, this is something we did learn from Indigenous Australians, but we don't apply it very well. So um, it, it's, it's a very delicate process that needs to be done on a small scale and a lot which which takes it with a with a attention to the local ecology and fire prone factors rather than broad scale burning so there's a lot of complicating factors in in there but um yeah it, it, it it's it's a difficult question um and you, everything is different in different places yeah no claude a future in flames I'm John Batchelor.